Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Hope everybody is okay out there. We've got a special guest with us today. We've got Ellen from Dive Ninjas joining us. She's sitting in. Um, Ellen's going to be giving a talk on April 15th for the kids, introducing them to coral reefs and uh, everything like that. Um, teach them a little bit of why they're so important. So make sure you check that out. It's on the website now. You can sign up for it. We're also working on a, an idea right now on building a marathon day, kind of like a binge watch day. We're going to have a bunch of presenters come in and do one day of just like six, seven talks uh, back to back. So we have like a full day. You can kind of binge watch, go grab some popcorn and just rock out all day. Um, Keep your eyes on uh, social media and all that. Make sure to follow us on at Dive Ninjas and everything to check all that out and get the updated info. Um, we've also just launched the poll, so that's ready to rock. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Pete. Pete, thanks for joining us today. How are you, man? Very well, man, very well. Thank you for having me here. Awesome, so Pete's a marine biologist currently working at Palacios Kakuna. Um, he's a PhD research researching hammerheads. Um, he's doing some really incredible research right now. Um, he's taking time off of that to sit down with us and teach us all about hammerheads today. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Pete. Thank you, brother. There you go. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, as Jay was saying, uh, I've been studying sharks for a while now, like a couple of years. I'm just starting my career. I'm doing my PhD now. And when Jay uh, gave me the, have the idea of the ocean stories, he invited me to present a little bit about intro, an introductory th uh, topic about hammerheads. That is what I'm most passionate about. So. Here it is. This is my lecture. I hope you like it. And wh whatever questions you have all along the all along my talk, please write it down. And at, at the end of the at the end of the of my talk, you can ask whatever question you have. Okay. So well, uh, welcome to Hammerheads 101. Again, I'm Pete, uh, and thanks for Pelagios Gakunja. That is my research center and Ocean Stories for having all these seminars. That I'm I'm pretty sure that I give us a lot of a lot of in interesting information in this complicated time for everyone. But well, uh, I wanted to start with, of course, the hammerhead. When I first saw a hammerhead, I was in the Socorro Islands. I, I think it was 2014, so it wasn't very long ago. I liked them. I liked them before that, but it wasn't since I saw my first hammerhead, my first live hammerhead, and actually it wasn't my first dive at Socorro when I saw it, that I completely fell in love of these, of these animals. And what I love about these animals is that, well, we have very weird, very weird looking animals in the ocean. We have very weird looking fish. But hammerheads are, are quite there. They're really alien looking creatures. They're so wonderfully weird. This head, all these combination of things make them super, super weird and very far from a lot of the, the different shark species that we have around. So this, this was what initially called my attention. And beside that, the vulnerability of them is what draw me to study them and find all that I can that I was possible to learn about them, to try to use all this science applied to conservation purposes. So, well, this that you saw, saw here in the 3D model, this is a hypothetical hammerhead. This actually is not like any particular species. It's like a mix of several, but it gives you like a general idea of how weird they are. If you really look to, into attention, they are absolutely very weird animals. But it's impossible to talk about hammerheads without talking a little bit about evolution. So uh, when scientists and taxonomists and a lot of people start to study about the evolution of sharks that are pretty much one of the most ancient vertebrates that we have in, in the planet, when they start to figure out where hammerheads came from, 
they say, okay, hammerheads are very particular, very unique, and they are very weird looking. So they, they might be like prior to the sharks, prior to any other shark species. Since these are the only sharks that have very different shapes and anatomical uh, morphology, different from any other shark species like the white shark, like the Galapagos, like the silky sharks, whatever stands out are the hammerheads. So scientists first start to, to realize that, well, of course, they were hypothesizing and saying, okay, if the hammerheads are different than any other shark species, they must be the first, one of the first shark species that appear in, on the planet and so on. Sharks start to evolve as the majority of sharks that we know, like the white, like the silky, like the Galapagos and so on. So they studied like the phylogenetic relations of the hammerheads with other sharks. And they actually find, found out that hammerheads are the most recent evolved shark species. So of course, they were thinking that it was completely the other way around. They were thought that they were the, the ancient, the basal shark, but it turns out that it's not. It turns out that it's, more, it's the most recently evolved. Uh, uh, nowadays, we have nine different species of hammerheads. We have going uh, the bonehead shark, the one in the far left, that is the smallest hammerhead species all the way to Firna Mokaran, the great hammerhead, that is the biggest one. So now, well, the hypothesis wasn't as they used to, okay? Hammerheads are the most recently evolved sharks. They say, okay, if they are the most recently evolved sharks, of course, the shape of the hammer had to be a process. If all the other sharks were first, were appear first in the history of nature than the hammerheads, of course, the hammerhead has to be slowly increasing its size of the many uh, big species that we have today. For example, the hypothesis was that hammerhead first time in the bonehead, that is the smallest one and with the smallest hammer, and then all the way to the winghead shark, that is the one uh, below in the far in the far right, that is the the shark with the biggest hammer in ratio of, of with the, its body size. But again, just again, they make all these uh, genetic and phylogenetic studies. And since nature doesn't give, doesn't care about what's make logic for us, they found out that they were again wrong. They found out that the first hammerhead species, that the basal hammerhead species is the windhead shark the shark with the biggest hammer of all. So the hammerhead species start with the one with the biggest hammer and evolve on the other side. So start from the biggest hammer all the way to the smallest hammer. So the most ancient is the windhead shark over here and the most new is the bonehead shark. So all this process is actually really weird. It's completely against our logic, completely against what we used to believe. Like this is an inverted process. But anyway, this is how it happens. So it's actually very interesting to talk about this because you can see in this in 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 these images that of course there are different shapes of the hammer, but now why do they have a hammerhead? Why? Do these shark species evolve with this very weird looking head? And of course, the answer is they have a lot of additional tools and a lot of uh, benefits of having this hammerhead shark, this hammerhead rather than a normal uh, shark head as. A lot of the other species. So I want to talk to you about how this head and how this, how the different senses and how the sharks, how the hammerhead shark 
sense their surroundings. The first question is, well, how do they hear? A lot of the shark species have little pores right behind the eyes. Those pores are the audit auditory cavity, the ears, just a small, a very, very tiny hole. However, hammerheads have it right in front of his face, right ab above his face. They have it right there where you can see the red arrow. That's also pretty looking pretty weird, but well, the main way as sharks and all the other bony fish here is not sounds itself, but they use these uh, modified cells all along the body. It's called the lateral line. The lateral line is a group of cells that are arranged in a line in the side of the body of each of the in each side of the body of any shark and any bony fish. So what the lateral, lateral line does, these cells can detect movements, can detect vibrations, can detect pressure gradients, and all this in the surrounding water. So this is how they hear. They feel all these different uh, stimulus on the surroundings, and they transduce this stimulus, they transduce these signals, into electric impulses that then they are triggered to the inner ear that is very close related to the uh, to one part of the brain that make all this information traduce in what we in what we uh, what we we call hearing. So this is actually very interesting, but this is not unique of the hammerheads. A lot of the uh, all of the shark species and all of the bony fish have this. Now, well, how do hammerheads smell? This is one of my favorite pics because this is a, an X-ray of the hammerhead, of a scallop hammerhead. So you can really see how weird it is. Of course, as all the shark, what, whatever you, what you see in, the, in an X-ray is not bone, it's cartilage, but you can see how weird the, the cartilage is so for your, for me to show you guys well this is an x-ray but this is pretty much how it looks how it looks like if you preserve this this is the like a solidified cartilage it has to be dry out of the sun sometimes cook but this is what you are looking at so this is like the skull of a hammerhead and it's really really weird like we have to be really honest this is some some very strange, very strange looking thing. But of course we can see the eyes in both ends, but right behind the eyes, right in these circles, in these uh, hollow places behind the eyes, that's the olfactory cavity. And as well as many other shark species, hammerheads have a very heightened sense of smell. They can really, smell very tiny and scattered particles of whatever of prey of blood of whatever in the water but the main reason that they are uh, very good smellers pretty much better than any other shark species is that they have these canals all along, all, all in front of the hammerhead they have these canals that whenever they go tilting their head whenever they are swimming all along, all across the ocean bottom or all, all in the water column doing this movement they're collecting water through these canals and this water is conducted to the nostrils to the olfactory cavity so they can really pick very small particles of whatever and they can really identify a lot of different smells a lot of different smells that are scattered all across the water. So with this movement of the head, with these canals, they also are one of the sharks with a better olfactory capacity of all. And of course, uh, it's pretty much obvious, the eyesight. Having two big eyes in most of the shark species, some of the hammerhead shark species have very small eyes, but in general, hammerheads have really big eyes located 
in the far end of each side of the hammers. Of course, this gave this give them an extraordinary capacity of sightseeing, of, of looking at things, an extraordinary eye capacity. So a lot of studies have uh, been trying to prove and determine the range of, of, of the visibility that hammerheads have. So depending on the, on the species, again, we have, uh, we come back to this model that is our 3D model of an hypothetical, hypothetical uh, hammerhead shark. They have an open and vertical eyesight that range between 180 and 200 degrees on each side. So that is a super wide range of eyesight on each side of the body. On the, on, on, the other, on the other hand, looking in a horizontal field view, they have pretty much the same, the same capacity between 180 and 200 degrees. And uh, of course, right in front of his face, right in front of his face, they have this 30 and 45 degree range of binocular vision. This means that the, the blue areas is what they can see with each eye, and the red area is what they can see with both eyes. So this gave an extraordinary capacity of their eyes. So their eyes can process a lot of information. And I'm pretty sure that, well, this is not like a 360 degree view, the one where, that it's exposed to you right now. But the thing is that hammerheads never swim completely straight. So what hammerheads do while they swim is that they tilt their head. They move their head from one side to the other. So with this movement and the degree and the range of vision that they have, they have pretty much a 360 degree vision on the vertical and on the horizontal plane. So pretty much they can see anywhere around them. The only blind spot they have is right behind the dorsal fin, but since they are always moving, they pretty much know, know where they cannot see. Actually, this is one of the main obstacles that we've had while studying hammerheads. Well, we want to tag them while scuba diving, while we want to take biopsies, because of course they can see us coming from many, many meters away. So it's one, this capability of, of looking of 360 degree vision is, has been one of a problem for us that we want to study them. Uh, as you can see in this video, this is uh, one of my favorite videos of schooling hammerheads because it was a, a, a steady cam located in the, in the ocean bottom uh, in Darwin and Arch in Galapagos by Simon, Simon Peach. So you can see uh, the schooling hammerheads coming really close to the camera, you can see them, you can see how they tilt their head, how they move from side to side. Of course, this was only possible because of course, they, there was no human around, there was a, uh, just the camera, but it, it gave us a really nice view of their behavior in the school, how they move their head, how they swim. So it's one of my favorite videos that we can find online. Uh, and of course, one of the most, and it's not, one of, it's not one of the most, but the main sense of all sharks is this, the ampullae of Lorenzini. The ampullae of Lorenzini are just very small pores, uh, pores located all across the cephalofoil. The cephalofoil is the head, is the hammerhead. All the sharks have this ampullae of Lorenzini, these small tiny pores that you can see right below uh, in, in this image, right in the, in the ventral face, in the ventral part of the hammerhead, these pores are filled with a, with a gel. This, this gel can sense electromagnetic and bioelectric fields. So all the sharks have this. However, with a the hammerhead, these shark species have the highest concentration Ampullae of Lorenzini than any other elasmo branch. So they are particularly sensitive to any electric or magnetic field. 
So this, they use it to find their prey in complete blackness, to find their prey when they cannot see it or smell it. For example, a lot of the shark species use the hammerhead as a metal detector that they go swimming right in the ocean bottom, like the bonehead shark, like the small eye, like the windhead shark, like the scoophead scoop shark. They use trawling all across the seabed, scanning, scanning the ocean bottom, finding their prey. So this is quite an amazing trait of many of these species. They are extremely sensitive to all these fields. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, a little bit further. Uh, one of the interesting facts that I want to share with you is about this species. This is the bonehead shark. Uh, as you remember, well, this is the smallest of all hammerhead species. This is the most recently evolved. Uh, there's not a study uh, yet published, but pretty much this is, mm, I think this is the most recently evolved shark of all of the sharks. And even though that is not that big, it's very particular in many different ways. For example, is the shark that have the shortest gestation period between four and six months. So it's a small shark that can, at the gestation periods last between four and six months, they can have four to 14 pops. Probably this trait of decreasing the rate, decreasing the time of gestation period can can be a trait acquired or developed due to the increase in in the in the decrease of the populations and they probably start to figure out that they need to produce pups faster every time so it's not yet published but what's that's one one of the theories also of course is the is the shark with the smallest cephalophoil the smallest hammerhead uh this this shark is so tiny and have this the head so tiny the the hammer so tiny that a lot of the hammerhead species with a bigger hammer they use it for swimming they use it for for swimming more efficiently for causing less drag for a lot of saving energy but since these hammerhead species have a very small hammer is the only shark species that use their pectoral fins to help it swim because the small size of its hammer and since living in the ocean bottom don't, doesn't allow them to swim very well. They use their pectoral fins to help them swim. So that's actually very interesting. Uh, another one is that in, in 2016, I think, or 2018 was published uh, a paper about this species that is the only shark species that is omnivorous. As you can see, one of these pictures, this, uh, this species live uh, in, in a lot of places where the sea, where the ocean bottom is covered by seagrass. So of course they look for their, for their prey below the seagrass. And it, it, was, it was considered that the ingestion of seagrass was accidental because they were eating animals that live on the seagrass. But uh, a study was made and they found out that they can absorb the cellulose. They can produce, they can uh, take advantage of the seagrass. They can eat plants and it's good for them. So it's actually really weird. It's the only shark that can eat plants. And uh, another thing very interesting is that this is the only shark, this was proven in captivity. Well, they was find out in captivity that uh, one of these females reproduce uh, it's called parthenogenesis. This means that this means this is a type of asexual reproduction. This means that the egg does not need to be uh, there's no need to be fertilized by sperm. So one of these females in captivity have an offspring that was a complete clone of her. So that's actually quite very interesting. And of course, this is the well. This is the only shark that have a sexual dimorphism. So, as you can see, the male and the females have different shapes of hammer. This is actually very weird, but it's the only shark that you, that have this sexual dimorphism. Of course, 
a lot of sharks have differences in, in sizes. For example, the females are always bigger than the males. But in morphology, as itself, this is the only one that have these particular traits. But uh, now I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my favorite hammerhead species. And my favorite hammerhead species is the scallop hammerhead. I love this species. This was, uh, this was the first hammerhead I saw. This is, uh, I, love, I, I love this species. And this is the one that aggregate in these big schools. I love it because there's a lot of things social about this shark. Sharks used to consider to be loners, just to travel in groups when they, uh, when they have the long migrations. But there's a lot of social components in the behavior of the scallop hammerheads that I love. Of course, uh, last year, at the, uh, uh, in December last year, 2019, it was considered critically endangered. So that's why also I decided to focus my entire research on this species to help provide all the tools to to help these species, to help the conservation of these species. Uh, these species have very particular things. For example, uh, very quick, the life cycle of this species is divided very, very uh, particularly in two main habitats, the oceanic islands and seamounts, for example, the Socorro Islands, Galapagos, Cocos, and the nursing areas near the coastline. So a lot of the main issue about this species is, exact, is precisely this life cycle. Uh, they aggregate in these huge, in these very big schools around the, the oceanic islands and seamounts, the ones that we, that they, for example, the video that I just saw you, that I just uh, show you uh, on Darwin Arch, they gather in these areas during daylight for social purposes. They gather in these schools to mate, to communicate with each other, and uh, they go a night out to hunt and they during the sunrise they come back to this same place to gather around uh, one of the things that for example this ampulla lorenzini help the scalp hammerhead is that well it, uh, just to explain you very quick this graph this graph was a, a, a work published by salvador jorgensen in 2014 and he proved how they do very deep dives how the scalp hammerhead can break can passed through the layer of minimum oxygen in the ocean. So they are also very toler tolerable to hypoxia. This is actually very interesting because they can go really, really deep to find their prey. For example, in, in one of the graphs, you can see that they go all the way to 1,000 1, meters deep. And this is because they hunt the jumbo squid. Jumbo squid is absolutely their favorite prey and they are found really deep. So in the, in the complete blackness of the ocean, they use the ample of Lorenzini to find their prey. They use their smell to find their prey in complete blackness. And they can tolerate they can tolerate high levels of hypoxia for a very small time. But it's actually very interesting about this species. Uh, also, one of the interesting facts is that they use this, uh, the, head, the hammerhead to travel, going back and forth from the main islands to the hunting sites or traveling to the coastline, they use their metal detector that they have in their head because the ocean bottom is always, uh, a lot of the oceanic ridges are filled with, with magnetite. Magnetite is a mineral that comes out with the, with the magma, with the lava in the ocean floor. This mineral have the particularity that is magnetically charged. So the hammerheads can feel this magnetism of the earth. So these, they use these ridges as highways, highways to travel back and forth to one island, highways to travel from the island to the shoreline. And imagine that this, the, the, the shark is swimming and following a highway. And when they stop sensing the magnetism, they know that they are out of the way. So they come back and they start to feel it back again. And that's how they can travel very far distances. They can do very uh, large migrations and they always find their way back. It's also, it's also uh, proven, and we try to give it an extra proof, that hammerheads, that scallop hammerheads have telepathy. This means that they come back to the same places to pop because they aggregate in these oceanic islands when they are uh, mature, and, they, and the females travel to the shoreline, to the nursing areas, 
when they want to pop, but one of the theories is that they always travel to the same areas. Uh, so, well, this is an, another video of the aggregation sites. This one is mainly done uh, in, in Cocos Islands. And, well, one of the main uh, things that I love about this shark, uh, as I told you, is the social component of it. There's no another more social shark than the scallop hammerhead. They do aggregate in the big schools that they initially were considered as only females, but now we can see that there are females, that there are juveniles, that they are males, that, well, there's a completely social component in the entire behavior of this species that I love and that make them very, very smart. Uh, and well, this life cycle makes, this life cycle between the Oceanic Islands and the, and the Nursing areas make that this species is very vulnerable to fisheries because they are fish all the way through the life cycle since they are born all the way since they are mature adults so this is one of the main reasons this species is considered critically endangered and this is one of the main reasons that we have to protect these species so uh, a little bit about my research uh, a lot of research has been done with these species this species is not is the research hasn't is not new but there's a lot of complications as i was telling you because it's a very hard shark to fish my scientists, ironically, they choose the wrong hooks. They choose the fisherman hooks instead of our hooks. So for fishermen, it's really easy to cut them. That's why the population has been depleted. But for us scientists, it's extremely hard. We still haven't figured out why. Scuba diving is very complicated with them because even you can see these big schools, getting close to them to tag them, taking a biopsy is very complicated because they can see us from miles away. So they can see where we come in they, and they just, they are very, uh, very afraid of humans. They're very, very, uh, they're not confident about bubbles, about all the noise we make. So they try to avoid us. So that's one of the things that make it very complicated for us to study them. But a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, many hammerheads uh, tagged with satellite tags, but they, they at, at the moment, they, that information haven't proven a lot. So what I'm particularly doing is I'm working with fishermen, I'm working with scuba divers, I'm working with dive companies. Uh, to, I build my own project to give it another focus. And that focus is using molecular tools, is using DNA samples. Because we have put a lot of tracks, a lot of acoustic transmitters, a lot of satellite tags, and they cannot give us the information that we want. They, not, they cannot give us the information that we need to protect them. So I, I propose an, another focus that just taking a small piece of tissue of sharks obtained of the fishery, like the ones that you're seeing in the images. Uh, for example, these are neonates. We can take a small, a small tissue sample of them. We can tag them. You can tag the juveniles and also, of course take a small tissue sample of them as well. We can tag the, the sub-adults in the aggregation areas and, as for, of course, take a tissue sample as well. And, uh, of course, uh, take a tissue sample of the, of the adults. The adults, are, are the one there is, you're seeing here is a female. You can see the scars. Take a biopsy of these of this, of this animals and use all that genetic information to to study them, to compare, to see where they're going, how they move, just by using the DNA signal of every one of these animals. So that's a little bit, that's a just really tiny part about my research. Of course, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about my research, a little more, uh, more about what we're doing, uh, just feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I will receive any question that you have, okay? All right. Thank you so much, Pete. That was really, really great. Thank you so much for taking the time today and talking with us and everything, teaching us all about these incredible animals. So let's open up some questions. Guys, if you have questions, you can click on the Q&A button, either at the bottom or top of your screen, type in your question, and we'll read them out to Pete, and uh, he'll give us some answers. 
So let's start. Teresa asks, uh, could you possibly see all nine species of hammerheads while diving? So basically, are they shallow enough? Uh, no. Uh, actually, one of the, of the facts about these species is that they have all, well, not all, but they have different distributions. For example, the only one that have the wider distribution is the scalp hammerhead, the species I'm studying. It has a, a, a circumtropical distribution through the, through the entire world in the tropical waters. But for example, uh, the great hammerhead, the smooth hammerhead, the great hammerhead lives in the sandy bottoms. The smooth hammerhead lives in the open ocean, mostly in the coastal areas where it is completely pelagic. Uh, the smaller shark, like the bonehead, like this, like the, like the California ham like the Carolina hammerhead, like the winghead, they live in sandy bottom. For example, the, the winghead is uh, lives in the in the Indo-Pacific. It only distributes there. So in the Indo-Pacific was a place where the hammerhead species start to radiate from other places to the world. But no, uh, pretty much seeing two hammerhead species in one place will be completely, will be very hard. Probably one of the only places that this can happen, probably maybe Florida, uh, that you can see the great hammerhead and the scallop, but it's very, very complicated. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pete. All right, Rose says, hey Pete, thank you for this amazing talk. You mentioned the bonnethead shark can have up to 14 pups. Is that per birth or during their whole lifespan? No, it's per birth. A lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the shark species, they range, for example, the ones that have fewer, uh, fewer pups are, for example, the white shark that, have, that can have from two to eight. Uh, the blue shark can have to up to 100 per, per birth. Hammerheads usually range 14, that is the smallest, between 14 and 30. This is the range of the hammerheads, but it's per birth. Every hammerhead species just gave birth like every couple of years, every other year. So that's the reproductive cycle of the hammerheads. Awesome. So Carla asks, can scuba divers help collect information by sending in videos or pictures to any organizations? Uh, Yes, they can give us, for example, a lot of the videos uh, of the schooling hammerheads are, are really good to assess populations. So, for example, here in the Gulf of California, lately a lot of videos have come up of the schooling hammerheads because hammerheads pretty much disappeared for 20 years in the Gulf of California, thanks to overfishing. So now that we're starting to look these videos, these scuba videos of the schooling hammerheads, we can see how big the hammerheads are. If we can have like uh, something to compare with, like a diver or something like that, to compare the sizes of the sharks. But most of it, the numbers. We can see if the if the schools are small, like 10, 20 individuals, or if the schools are big, like more than 100 individuals. We can assess like if the schools are bigger and bigger every day, uh, every year. We can like have a glimpse, an idea of that the health of the hammerhead population in that place is good. If we see small sharks with very, with very uh, small numbers, the population is not that good. So that's the way we can assess thanks to, to, to videos, mostly videos and photos. Because we, we cannot, uh, uh, like photo ID sharks, actually with hammerheads doesn't work like that. It's very complicated. But if you can have a, a video of a school, we can determine if you can tell us where it was taken and when, we can estimate the number and see how the populations are growing in different places. Cool, oh. thanks Pete. So uh, Suzanne asks, I heard that hammerheads also use the hammer as a weapon to pin down their prey on the ground. So that does that apply to the scalloped hammerhead as they hunt for squid, which are not on the ground? Uh, actually, no, actually the, the, the hammerhead is not used to it's not due to, to pain or to heat or to uh, immobilize any, any animal because one of the most vulnerable parts of all the shark species are the eyes. So you cannot use your hammer when you have eyes in both ends to heat or to do anything else when your eyesight will be compromised. So the hammerhead is not used to as a weapon. It's not just, well, not just as a, as a physical weapon, it's just as a weapon to detect movement, to, spin, to sense, to feel, to hear, to see, but it's not used to hit. 
probably it just uh, it used as communication, it used as, as many other things, but it's, it's not like that. Since uh, the eyes are very fragile, they will never compromise that capacity that they have hitting uh, animals with their with their hammer. So they pretty much use it, for example, they are, they are sharks, they are predatory sharks, they are extremely, extremely good hunters. So they use the advantages that they have, like the electroreceptivity, like that they can see without having their eyes, for example, in complete blackness, they are very, very, very good hunters. And whatever prey they use for, they hunt beneath the, the seabed, like crabs, like shrimp, when they're small, they just need to detect it and they, uh, dug it down with their, with their mouth. So they, they, um, they never use the hammerhead as a, as a weapon per se. That's really interesting, really, really incredible. So Carla asks, how many hammerhead species are endangered? Uh, well, the ones that are endangered are uh, three, is the scallop hammerhead, the smooth hammerhead, and the great hammerhead are the ones with uh, the highest concern of endangered or critical endangered. The other ones are considered uh, less vulnerable, or, uh, but a lot of that is due to a lack of information rather than actually being endangered or not. So a lot of shark species, as I was telling, there's not very, they're not very easy to study. So if they are not yet considered endangered, it's not because they're not, it's because there's not enough information to back that uh, that status of endangered or critical endangered, but in in absolute terms, the skull of hammerhead is the one that has the higher risk because have the highest the the broader distribution, and it has the most valuable fin of all, of all the shark fins for the Asian markets. So, ham, a skull of hammerhead had high quality fins. It's called quality one prime quality of the fence, so it's target for the fence. So that's one of the issues. That's really interesting. All right, Pete, so Sue asks, why do some species of hammerhead school and others appear to be very solitary? Uh, that's actually quite a good question. That's quite a good question because we do not know. <laughs> we do not know what, why is the, this, the skull of hammerhead is the only shark species that aggregate socially. A lot of shark species like the black tips in Florida, like the silky sharks here in the Pacific, they travel as in huge numbers, but they travel as a part of their migration. But hammerheads gather every day with social purposes. So we do not know why they do it. You know, why it's the only species that does it. And not only of the hammerheads, of any other sharks, because you can see in the seamounts in the Oceanic Islands, a lot of sharks of the same species, but they are just there because of, of the of the conditions of food, of a lot of the upwelling, uh, but have like a social interaction between each other, like the hammerheads do. Like they just swim around, standing by, communicating with each other, just chilling around the the sea mount is something that is not present in any in any other species. So we do not know. We do not know why this is the only species that does it. This is why I'm so fascinated about it. Uh, it's really incredible. And I think anyone that's ever seen a uh, school of hammerheads underwater, it's just, it's a beautiful experience, something you definitely don't forget. And incredible to see that, you know, when you see other species, how they're always solitary and by themselves and this kind of things makes you appreciate it even more when you get to see a hundred of them or 50 of them go by. So, yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing sight. Really is. So Faye asks, you mentioned that hammerheads are very social. Um, is there any evidence of them migrating separately and then coming back together in the same place and perhaps recognizing each other in some way? Uh, well, of course, we have no idea if they can recognize each other. I'm pretty sure they do. But uh, how hammer, hammerheads travel is, for example, when they are fully grown and they are in these big school, in these big schools, in these aggregation sites like Oceanic Islands, uh, the only ones that migrate to the coastal areas are the females, because only the females are the ones that pop, that need to give birth 
to their to their to their neonates in these very productive, very protected shallow areas like our estuaries, like our coastal lagoons, like our mangrove systems. So they move, they travel alone. They not they do not travel as a group. They travel alone to these areas and they come back to the same aggregation area. We do not know if they come back to the same aggregation area, but that's one of the things I want to prove. I want to prove if the genetic signature give me the same uh, in different years. And, and I can identify, for example, a mom, I can take a biopsy of a female and a biopsy of a neonate in the coastline and I can relate them if they are son or daughters or cousins or whatever. That's one of the things that we need to prove. Uh, if they can recognize each other, I'm pretty sure they do. I'm pretty sure they're, they're very smart. I'm pretty sure that between all animals, they can recognize each other. But there's absolutely no way that we can know this, you know? Probably just tagging the same shark or, or, or tagging a couple of sharks at one specific moment and then see how long do they stay in a specific time. And if they go back and forth, the same sharks are in the same area, well, that would be one way. But it's still hard, hard, uh, hard job to do. That's really, really incredible. Um, so Annie asked, this is very interesting, thank you. How do hammerheads sleep? Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is a good question that, well, we have all the time. And the answer is they don't. <laughs> as, any, as any of the big shark species, except from one, uh, the nurse shark. The nurse shark is the only big shark species that can just stand completely still in the ocean bed without moving. But any, all the other shark species need to be continuously moving so they can breathe. So how they breathe is when they are moving, of course, as, in, as any fish, they extract the oxygen out of the ocean water. So it's like a counter current strategy. So imagine if the water goes this way and the blood flows this way, the friction in the, in the gills make uh, the oxygen pass from the water to the bloodstream. But for that, you need to be moving. So all the sharks never sleep. They just enter like, a, like, in, like in a standby mode. They diminish their system. And they use like uh, what we call a, a gliding. For example, imagine that this is the shark swimming. When they sleep or rest, they just go all the way to the, almost to the surface, and they just start to dive down using gravity. So they can shut down a lot of their systems, and they are continually moving because gra gravity is pulling them down. So that's the counterflux. I'm telling you, so they have their, their mouth wide open so their water can enter through their mouth and flow through their gills. So they dive down, they, they let go, like very, very slowly moving, diving down without uh, con con saving all the energy that they have. And when, when they reach to the bottom, they go all, all the way back up and do it all over again. That's how they rest, that's how they save energy. But Big sharks never sleep. They have to be always on the move so they can breathe. Must be super tired. <laughs> um, Christine asks, how far can hammerheads hear and smell? And also, who gave them their name? Uh, well, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that the name hammerhead is pretty straightforward. I don't <laughs> know that, like the first like ancient people that caught a hammerhead, whatever they say, I don't know, when, when people start to work with tools and whatever, they figure out that, well, this looks pretty much like a tool. And uh, of course, as any, as any scientific name, for example, the, the scientific genre of hammerheads is Firna. Firna, of course, means, uh, means hammer in Greek. Of course, the, the word in Greek, is uh, means hammer is firna is in latin as any other scientific name uh so well that's pretty much straightforward uh the other question what it was it was uh, how far can hammerheads hear and smell ah, 
Okay, yeah. Uh, this question, we, we, we do not know for sure. Of course, it said that sharks can smell blood like 10 miles away and whatever. Of course, that's, that's not true. Uh, it's not that if I put a drop of blood, tuna blood or human whatever here at 10 miles over there, a shark is smelling that, that's not true. What happened is that when it hit the water, whatever it, it, whatever we put in the water, like or like the scent of a fish, the scent of a squid, like blood, uh, it's diluted in the water, and that small particle, like that blood, that drop of blood, make a lot of really really tiny uh, blood of drops that travel through the that travel through the ocean, and that's when it reached the shark, that's how, that's why they pick up. That's what, that's why they sense that, what they smell. Uh, of course, the range is not yet proven because there's been a, a, several lab works done with the smaller fishes, for, with the smaller species, like for example, with the bonehead, that you can keep it in a tank. No other, no other shark species can be kept in a tank except the smallest one. So they, tr they, they use a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, experiments, but with, the electrical fields. I mean, if they have uh, in a big pool, they surround this big pool with wire and they like turn on one side of the pool to see if the sharks get drawn to each side. It's actually very interesting. They put uh, like a batteries or something hidden be be below the sand. And when they put the battery on, they see like the, like the shark searching exactly above the battery. But the range of how that far they can see and smell is not yet to be proven. It's, it's very complicated for us. Uh, we have no way to tell it because there's no way of we knowing when the shark is smelling or seeing something. Since we cannot be in their shoes, we cannot see how far they are, they are able to see us. So it's, it's not an easy question. And, uh, I'm, and I'm pretty sure this is very hard and very hard to prove and very hard to study that. I can imagine it sounds really uh, difficult to figure out the answer to. Yeah. So the uh, Fernanda says, asks um, well, two questions in a row. The first one is, th is there any way to identify hammerheads like using the spots of eagle rays or the spots on whale sharks? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, as in, in, in one of the, in one of my, of my, of my images, I show you that, like, of course, the hammerheads are identified by the shape of their hammer. So, and all the hammerhead species have a different hammer head. For example, the the bonehead that has really narrow edge, the scoop head have a different face. The, for example, the, the scallop hammerhead has like four lobes, two on each side, with a small piece in the middle. This this small like empty space in the middle, the, the, for example, the smooth doesn't have it, the great hammer has, the, the front of his face is like completely straight all the way to the eyes a little bit. So you can identify these hammerheads to, to, to the hammer, but you can see like, you have to see like the face like this or like this, so you can really identify the hammer. Actually, it's quite difficult. For example, the smooth hammerhead and the scallop hammerhead are very, hard to identify. So you have to be really familiar with the species to know which species are you, are you, are you dealing with. So that's the only way. They, they do not have spots. They do not have anything across the body besides the hammerhead. But is it a, are you able to identify an individual by the hammer? Or is there another, any other ways to identify individuals? Or is it? No. no. Well, what we use to identify individuals is, uh, we have to tag them. We have to use a, spa a spaghetti tag to see which individual we have. A lot of spaghetti, ta spaghetti tags have uh, a color coded, so you can identify an individual without you having to recapture the shark. Probably you're diving and you see like, a, uh, and in your, in your picture, you have several colors. You can say, okay, this is this shark. But actually identifying all the way through individuals has not yet been done because since it's hard to get just one, or tag just one, tagging a lot would be, is, is, is still not, uh, not very productive because when you have one, well, 
I tag one here, you see it the next day, okay, this is the only one that I have tagged. But they have, a, a lot of the females, for example, they have scars near, near, near the gills and the pectoral fins. A lot of scars done by the mating. But I've seen, uh, I've seen sharks having the scars and a couple of weeks later, probably wasn't, probably uh, if we can make sure that it's the same shark, but they can heal, all the scars they can heal in one or two weeks, doesn't matter how deep they are. So if you have different scars, they heal very, very fast. So the skin looks really nice and smooth. I'm pretty sure that they have like birthmarks and a lot of dots and a lot of things all around the body, but getting that close to look at them, like an uh, eagle ray or a whale shark that you can really easily identify them is not, is not viable. All right, makes sense. It sounds like it would be really, really difficult and must make research very hard when you're unable to just like find uh, distinctive individuals and everything. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. That's why we're using uh, DNA because, well, we, we don't, when, when you are studying a hammerhead, you do not have enough time for you to look at, uh, really to look close at the hammerhead to see what the individual is. You just try to do your thing. And probably if we, if by an, amazing accident we have like two identical dna signatures okay that probably we sample the same individual twice you know but that's the only way and it's right. and, and speaking of the tags can this the tags that you guys are using can they sustain pre the pressure for when they dive below a thousand meters yeah they, they are uh, a lot of the a lot of the tags can uh can sustain that that pressure a lot of them can for example, the, the acoustic tags that we put, they're just like a battery. We, we usually put them uh, either externally using a pulse spear or internally using a, 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 surgical, a surgical procedure when we are able to cut the shark. And they're completely, it's like a battery. So pressure does not affect them. Another, uh, other, other tags, more complicated one, more expensive like satellites that have like cameras and a lot of sensors. They are too sensitive to pressure. So a lot of this tag has a, an automatic release. When the tag reaches a specific pressure, it gets deployed, it gets detached from the shark and it flows to the surface. So, we, so, it, so it doesn't get destroyed. So they have a sense depth, a sense, uh, a depth, depth sensor. So when they reach their maximum depth of capacity, they detach and they go to the surface to save whatever information they have. Super cool. Um, so Charlotte asks, um, you said that hammerheads are susceptible to hypoxia on deep dives. Are they at risk of the bins as well? No, uh, not, not that, not uh, oh, like in any other, well, deep dive marine animals, they are completely built for that. We are not built for going that deep. That's why we get the bends, that's why our system, that's why we have uh, scuba limits, that's why we have depth limits, that's why we have a lot of different uh, mix of gases. So we can make our body as resistant and as resilient and, uh, and limit our body itself. But a lot of the animals that have evolved in the ocean does not have that, does not have that different, uh, that, uh, that like trauma like the, like the bends. They they don't they don't uh, they don't have it. The thing is that since it's hypoxic, of course, all all these animals and as as many others, they are not built to live permanently in these deep waters. Like a lot of a lot of uh, deep sea animals that they are evolved and they live in these super hard pressure conditions, super cold condition, hypoxic conditions. Sharks can, hammerheads can tolerate the hypoxia, but they cannot live with the hypoxia. So that's why all the dives they do, they do it really, they, they call yo-yo dives, that they go up and down, up and down, because they, can, they have to go all the way down to hunt, but they have to go all the way up so they can oxygenate the self and do it all over again. So they don't have risk of going up and down as fast as they want. Uh, marine animals don't have that. They are evolved to, uh, to tolerate the pressures their body allows them to. That's really incredible. Um, Anonymous asks, do hammerheads ever get stung by the stingrays that they try to eat? And if so, how do they avoid this? Of course, of course they get stung. Of course they get stung. 
but as as any predator, of course, the prey sometimes the prey are equipped with defensive mechanisms. Of course, like if if a specific stingray has a, a specific type of of chemical or of venom or whatever, of course they pretty much do nothing to the to the sharks. Whatever injury they cause them is unless it's in the eye or something like that, I'm pretty sure it can happen. They can heal out really quickly. Uh, it's not related to hammerheads, but for example, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a colleague of mine wrote a, a, a scientific note that they caught, that somewhere in the, in the Gulf of California, they caught uh, accidentally, by accident, a great white shark. And when they checked the great white shark, they found out that it got the like this like the sting of a of a stingray like in in one of the in the in one of the vertebrae near the near the tail so that shark wasn't allowed to swim correctly because the sting was really inside of the vertebrae like affecting all the nervous system all the motility of the tail so it started to worn out, and that's why it it went looking for an easy prey that eventually got him caught, like in the fishing in fishing gear. And they they determined that that was the reason because he died because it was a stingray caught him and eventually warm him out, and that can that can happen for sure if they get if they give a uh, uh, sting in the eye or in a very sensitive place, of course, they can harm them. I'm, I'm pretty sure they receive a lot of them the, the same way, like, for example, sperm whales receive a lot of the scratches and a lot of, uh, of harms of the, of the giant squids that are hunting, orcas, hunting whatever. I am pretty sure that they receive a, a, lot of, a lot of injuries, but they're just predators. This is what they do is just survival. Yeah, it's a crazy story. Um, Pauline asks, how long do they live and how large do the great hammerheads get? Um, okay, uh, usually the range, uh, the lifespan of the hammerheads range between 20 and 30 years. The one that have been studied, for example, the scalp hammerheads, this is, this is the range that we have been able to identify of the oldest hammerheads that have been caught. Because, of course, we only know how old is a shark after it's dead? It doesn't mean that it cannot go, uh, cannot live longer than that, because we use a lot of techniques like, like measuring the the layers of the circles of the vertebrae, the same way they determine the age of the trees, of the rings of the trees. We use the, that that same technique. But of course, again, if we caught a shark that was uh, caught on the on the fisheries that shark didn't die of natural causes. So that the biggest sharks that the, the age was determined was around 30 years. I'm pretty sure that they can live longer than that. If we, if we let, let them be, I'm pretty sure that they can live probably 40, 50 years, I'm pretty sure. Hammer, uh, for example, a white sharks can live up to 100 years, so I'm pretty sure that's, that's range. And the great hammerhead, well, great hammerheads can, be, can, be, can grow really big. Smooth hammerheads, the biggest ones are the biggest ones ever uh, ever found were around four meters. Great hammerheads between five and six probably, so they can get really, really big. Yeah, they're gigantic animals, incredible to be in the water with. Um, we actually will be back out in December. We go back to, we run a trip to Bimini um, to see them. It's one of my favorite things seeing them right now. They're huge. Um, this, incredible to see them like even like dwarfing tigers at some times and or anything like that it's a really really amazing creature um tom asks what parts of the world can you find scalloped hammerheads well actually uh the place the best places to to dive with a scallop hammerhead we have it in in this part of the world in the eastern tropical pacific uh the socorro islands in mexico Cocos Island in Costa Rica, Galapagos in Ecuador, and Malpelo in Colombia, in this part of the world. On other places, probably the Red Sea is one of the best places to see scallop ham schooling scallop hammerheads. But for sure, I will prefer 
any one any of these islands because they are really uh, upwelling sites and really biological hotspots that you just, you just can not can only see school and hammerheads but a lot of different shark species so if you're planning any scuba trip cocos malpelo galapagos or socorro will be my dive choices definitely definitely uh jacob asked what was the mineral that the scallop hammerheads can detect from magnetic impulses during migrations it's called magnetite like that magnetite magnetite it's this kind of mineral that comes from from basalt from magma that is electromagnetically charged so of course if you see like a small piece of pebble of magnetite the signal will be very 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 few very very weak but if you multiply this by a, by an oceanic rich field with this mineral i'm pretty sure that uh that you can you can imagine how a shark can feel and can sense all this magnetism awesome so sorry just thought of so tom asks are hammerheads caught as bycatch and if so what methods can help to reduce this uh yeah hammerheads are caught i caught for bycatch mostly in in the coastal areas uh because a lot of the a lot of the coastal fisher, fisheries that look for groupers or snappers they use hooks they use baited hooks so a lot, lot of the so that's one way sharks get caught also they use uh in the coastal areas they, they use um, fishing nets that catch everything so the thing about uh, about shark is that it's, it's very complicated to do it like a like a very specific fishery because the hooks that you use for mahi mahi or for or for uh, swordfish or for groupers or for, you can catch different sharks of different sizes because if you put a fish of course sharks feed on fish so it's a bait it's, it's a baited hook so being using like a selective fishing art for a shark is it's precisely been the issue because we have not find one that is that target only what you want to fish like mahi mahi like groupers or snappers or whatever and not sharks so sharks have been part of the of the uh, bycatch of the tuna fisheries the, the big sharks of the small the the bony fish all across the the coastal areas all over the world so the way to protect this area the way to protect these species is not by the by the art form but by the area so you have to protect specific areas when you when we when we can find out which areas are more important for the species you can shut down the fissures in that specific area. That's why marine protected areas are so important. But my absolute, what, what I, this is also a, a very controversial thing. This is very hard, a very hard choice for everyone. But I'm pretty sure that the only way of saving species like the hammerheads is shutting down or protecting the species as a whole can be in in doesn't have to be worldwide but for example that i live in mexico that's i've been talking with fishermen the only way of for to save a species like that is to protect the species as a whole we see other examples like the sea turtles like the mobile arrays that now they are blooming we have a lot of sea turtles a lot of rays that are still in that the populations are pushing back are are are, are increasing because the species was completely protected because if you protect a small area sharks and marine animals do not know about boundaries do not know about limits so they can get out of these areas and get targets anyway there's this a lot of illegal fishery so the only way to for in my opinion the only way of saving species like this is to protect the species as a whole and make it illegal to the fisheries of course it's gonna be, still be still be cut but since it's illegal, a lot of people are going to have a lot more careful. They're not going to go in the areas where you can cut this the most 
and a lot of things have to change. We really appreciate all your hard work in this matter. Um, Amanda asks, uh, do they have any predators other than mankind? Uh, well, as when there are neonates and juveniles, yeah. When there are neonates and juveniles and they're located in the coastal areas, they are very small. The hammerheads uh, are born measuring 40 centimeters. That's pretty small. That's pretty much the size of my stop shark right here. <laughs> so they're very small, so they can be prey of bigger sharks, even bigger hammerheads can be. They, they're not, it's, it's not normal for cannibalism, but even bigger groupers or bigger snappers or bigger sharks, they can eat them when they're small. When they are big, it's not common. It's not common to have other predators. For example, it's been a couple of records of tiger sharks eating hammerheads, of orcas eating hammerheads, but they're just uh, like occasional occasional prey is not that they feed precise, uh, specifically on hammerheads or that the tigers feed specifically on hammerheads or the orcas feed specifically on hammerheads. Doesn't happen like that. They can because tigers tend to be a, a lot more massive, a lot, more, a lot stronger than hammerheads. And of course, orcas, well, are orcas. But besides those, uh, I don't think that they have any other natural predator. Awesome. And Ro asked, what can we do to help protect hammerheads? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a very important question. And what you can do to protect hammerheads, you have to start by watching what you eat. I don't know where you're from, but for example, here in Mexico, uh, Hammer, uh, shark meat is really cheap and it's actually really good. It's, it, 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 it tastes like fish. So here in Mexico, is, uh, here in Baja, it's very common to have, for example, shark in the fish tacos. So you go to any restaurant and you ask for fish tacos. Fish tacos is like a small piece of fish, like breaded. We, we, we call it like that. Uh, so it's like, it's like, uh, how you call it, it's like fried. So once the food is processed, when, when the fish is, fish is fried or cooked, whatever, you cannot really distinguish what you're eating. If you're eating shark or grouper or whatever they're telling you what it is, you just, it just tastes like fish. So the first, the first step will be, be very careful in what you eat. Uh, doesn't, don't, don't buy, of course, don't buy shark. But a lot of the issue about shark is that it's mislabeled. A lot of the supermarkets in in the states, in Mexico, in Walmart, Soriana, here, a lot of the, a lot of different supermarkets, they they sell shark meat. Here in Mexico, we'll, we, they call it cazón. You see, uh, caso filet, that is just like a, a medallion, kind of like the tuna ones, but bigger. That is shark. Uh, of course, never buy shark. Never buy shark. That's one one of the things that you can do. And the other th the other thing is, if you need or want to, I eat fish. I love fish, but I always buy the fish in the local markets because that way I support the local fishermen. The local fishermen are usually very poor, very humble, and and that way, if you buy it at the source, you can see what you are buying. You can see that you're not buying shark. That you're not, that you're buying like the fish as a whole, or you can, you, you know what you are eating. So that would be the first step. And um, second step, well, we, we have a lot of different organizations, a lot of different projects that we study, that we study sharks. So for the next step that we scientists need to take is we have to have all the information ready. So we can give them to the authorities, so we can give them to the governments, so they can make the policy to protect it. But first, you, we need to do the science. And science is expensive. So uh, a suggestion will be find the best and your favorite organization, your, fa your favorite research organization, not conservation, because there are a lot of conservation. But for conservation, you need the research first. 
you need the science, then we all work hand in hand. But the science is pretty much the most expensive because we need field work, we need tax, we need a lot of different things. We need lab, uh, lab time, we need a lot of different things. So find your best and your favorite uh, organization, scientific organization, scientific lab, work with people, work with, uh, with uh, projects like here, like my project, like the projects of, of Dive Ninja that they do mix science with conservation and tourism use this as a tool to help us so whenever you go to a to a citizen science project you're giving us a platform so we can use so we can do our science whenever you're donating money or time or resources or publicity or whatever to one uh, to an ngo that does research you're giving them a lot of help because a lot of the ngos like the ones i work with we depend on donations so if funds are uh, if we a good funding we can do a, a, a good research in less time so here time is of the essence because sharks are are in just 10 years they pass from uh, the scale of hammerhead pass from endangered to critical endangered in 10 years probably they're not going to be any more in 10 years from now so we need all the resources all the platforms to haste all our research so we can so we can have the science ready as soon as we can so the authority can take uh the decision that can make the decisions as soon as we give it to them so we still have time for populations to rebound i uh, think it's really great to hear and everything like that and for everyone out there that's not really familiar with our platform that's kind of what a lot of what that we were doing what pete was saying is a lot of our expeditions and trips and these things they're built in a citizen science way and i know a lot of people uh citizen science is kind of a, a bit newer in the industry and everything like that but the programs essentially support the researchers and scientists in different ways whether it's giving them a platform for them to conduct research while teaching the guests and the guests getting to be involved in it um, but then there's other ones we do where like we actually help fund it by donating uh, half of the profits or something like that to a research to the research organization um, to help fund the research and kind of keep things going this way uh, tourism becomes a bit more sustainable and it's actually pushing to help research move forward and um, pushing for conservation and these kind of things can keep moving uh, ahead and move uh, ahead faster. Um, I'll give a talk actually on April 18th, it's on the calendar now where we talk about um, kind of the story of Dive Ninjas and how this idea came to be and how, what it does and how it does what it does and everything like that. So make sure to check that out. Um, but thank you, Pete, that's really, really great information. Um, so Marie asks, uh, when diving in the re Red Sea, dive, prof dive professionals over there were mentioning that often the scalloped hammerhead shark's shoal was led by one individual ahead of the group that was acting as a leader for the rest of the shoal. On your side, have you been able to observe, document any particular shoal patterns during your studies? Uh, well, that's actually very interesting. Uh, what I have, what I have found out is that uh hammerheads in different areas behave differently i'm not sure if if the school as a whole but at least for example with the presence of divers for example here in socorro we have like really like our hammerheads our mexican hammer hammerheads are really easily frightened they are ah, they're so hard to study them mexican ones but if you go a, a little bit southern to cocos to galapagos they're not that afraid of divers so probably that's like an acquired, uh, like an acquired behavior that they learn to get away from us, probably. But as as you mentioned, uh, like one hammerhead going in front of the school. I'm not sure. For example, the I, I've never been in the uh, in the Red Sea, but how schooling hammerheads usually work, uh, how how the school usually organizes, is that. The leaders, they're never in front. They're in the middle of the school. And they're not like the lead of the pack, but they are the big females. The big females are the biggest sharks. As, as in many species, the biggest is the most dangerous, the most strong. In sharks, there are always the females that are the biggest. 
and they are located in the in the center of the school surrounding them in the edges in the perimeter are the juveniles the female juveniles that are not yet mature and in the outer part of the of the schools are the males that males try to get their way into the school to mate with the females however we we thought that that was the whole uh, organization of every school well we found out that is not for example i've seen schools of only males we, we thought that this the that most of the of the schooling ones were the females but i have seen schools made by only males actually in roca partida one of the places in the Socorro islands here in mexico the school that we have in that place is a very small pinnacle of rock in the middle of nowhere the school over there is entirely made of by males and in the other in and in the other islands the schools are made by females and in this uh, organization that i'm telling you so probably I, I don't know because they i'm pretty sure that they have different organizations different uh, social structures depending on i don't know uh, the site temperature the area i'm pretty sure that it, it can happen like that here in the East tropical pacific uh, i've never i've never we have never identified like a female or some of uh, the biggest heart leading a group because they all move like a whole and they just go circling around so you never know where the where the school starts and where it ends because they're like circling around so you know and since they are not traveling they do not need to be led you know they're just moving and swimming around swimming around swimming around so probably it's 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 a very interesting thing i i haven't read anything about uh of school in hammerheads having a leader but probably you know as i was telling you they are very social animals so probably in different places of the world they have very they have different social structures probably it's in some places they have to they, they do have a leader of the school probably uh but i'm not sure usually the 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 schools of fish move as a whole without their little list you can see this in sharks in anchovy in sardines they don't have a leader they, they just move as a whole that's the power of the school itself you can see here in mogul arrays you don't see like one biggest one leading the pack no you should see moving like a one single organism so i'm not sure but it's really interesting that's really, really interesting in the museum too i remember when i when i worked in the red sea we would hear that about the um, like one leading and everything sometimes even at gordo banks you'll kind of see the school together and one kind of in the front coming towards you and then the one will turn and the whole school will kind of move wow. with it and everything like that. It's really interesting to see their their social behavior and how that works and what they're doing, whether whether one is actually, you know, protecting the others by moving yeah. ahead or if it just happens to be that one's up there and we, you know, see yeah, it. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't, um, I, I don't know how that works, but it's, it's going to be a nice topic. Yeah, to exactly. Talk. Definitely some great research for someone to get in. Yeah. So Kencho asks, uh, he says, really nice talk, Pete, quite interesting. Regarding the mobility and maneuverabil maneuverability of the sharks, you mentioned that hammerheads won't stri uh, swim straight and that only the smallest of the species of them will use their pectoral fins for balance. So all other species use their pec fins for something else, for a different activity or a behavioral purpose? Mm, yeah, this, this is actually uh, a good question. Uh, well, all, all, all the shark species, all the sharks use, the movement of the sharks is very analog and very similar to the movement of a plane. Uh, what they, how they use it, their pectoral fins is, so sharks are very negatively buoyant. So they use mostly their pectoral fins to keep on flying, to keep at the same level, to control the level they are they are in the in the ocean column that's how they that's how they use their pectoral fins if they want to go up or down they use it like the analog to a wings of a plane like for sustentation the cuddle fin of course is the propulsion and the dorsal fin is mainly used to of course to cut the water to cut down the drag but also like a how you call it like a tilt more like a to, to, for direction even though it does it doesn't move when they tilt their head they use the 
the dorsal fin like a sail, like to avoid drag and direct the water to a specific place where they are moving. Hammerheads tilt their head to see all their surroundings, to feel, but they tilt their head, but they also swim sideways. Because swimming sideways, they increase like the wind span and making more efficient, making the movement more efficiently. So swimming like this, save a lot of energy for the hammerheads. Um, uh, the great hammerheads does it, the scallop hammerheads always like swim sideways, like always showing their belly. They do this to save energy. And when you see them schooling, they also like turn around completely to reflect the light with their white belly. That uh, we believe that it, that's a form of communication between each other. But yeah, the, the movement of the pectoral fins and the caudal fin is very analog to, to uh, to a plane, it's called the, the movements are called pitching. That is, well, uh, I, I don't recall how it's the movement, but pitching and how it's how it, mm, let me see if I can remember. Is the movement they control the movement like that, like yep. this, and uh, and the roll like this, like this, and like this. So that's what that's how they they, they use the 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 fence. So the bonehead chart that. The tilting doesn't work very well because of the small hammer. They have a longer pectoral fence, so they can compensate to the small hammer, and it's the only one that moves its pectoral fence to help it swim. They usually live in the in the in the sea floor, but it's interesting how they do it. It's just an an adaptation of the of the shark to their environment. Awesome. Really, really interesting. So we're running out of time, guys. We only got time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, also, in I launched the poll results and everything like that. A few, a bunch of people had said they were interested in learning more about the online courses. Ellen, that's actually sitting right next to me, wrote an article about it the other day. So I'll paste the article into the chat group in case anyone wants to learn more about that or anything. Um, so, and then next question, we'll do two more questions and then we'll get out of here. We'll stop taking up all your time so you can get back to work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Antonio asks, hey Pete, thanks for the great presentation. I've seen that quite often there are jacks and hammerheads hanging out together. Is there a symbiotic relationship between them? And if so, what is the benefit of this relationship for them? Uh, there's no uh, an official register of, the, of being a symbiotic about them. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of what big fish do uh, when they are surrounded by, when they are, when they are in the same space of sharks, of course, sharks bring, uh, bring them a lot of protection because uh, not a lot of organisms want to get close to sharks. So being there together uh, helps, uh, helps them to be protection. What I've seen is that a lot of these uh, jacks like to scratch on the scales of the sharks. I haven't seen it in hammerheads, but I've seen jacks and other fishes scratch on the skin of silky sharks, on the skin of whale sharks, probably taking out parasites. And, of, and, and the other thing I can think of that I have seen is that jacks usually eat the remorase attached to sharks. One of the issues that, we, that we've had is that a lot of the external tags that we put in the sharks we put it right below the right below the the dorsal fin imagine that is a like a really tiny thing like this and a lot of these tags we have lost them because fish pull them out because jacks are used to pull out like the remorace like remorace are really are, are really easy uh, a really easy meal because it's attached to a shark so it's not moving and Usually in these places where sharks are not traveling, they're moving really, really slowly. They have their guard down because they know they're sharks, so they're just chilling or in the cleaning stations. So a lot of the jacks take advantage of this and get near them and pull these remorace out of them. Of course, they have mistaken our transmitters with a remorace, so they, uh, that, that's why we don't like to put them externally anymore because they get uh, detached or fish uh, get them. Uh, but that's, that's the only thing I can think of. That they eat the remoray and they use it because the jackfish, as, as, as same as tuna, they have a really soft skin. So they have a lot of parasites. 
and they swim like in in, in this uh, in this direction because the the tentacle uh, the skin of the shark is really smooth on this side but it's really coarse like sandpaper on this side so they use it to scratch all this all those parasites i've seen that in many shark species and with a lot of different fish that makes me laugh i'm picturing right now like you guys getting data back from a tag and being like, what is wrong with this data? And then cut yeah. screen and there's a jack <laughs> with one of the, ta the uh, tags in his mouth just bouncing around, swimming around dive sites and taking off. <laughs> yeah, that, that has happened. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So last question from today comes from Morgan. She says, how did you translate your passion for hammerheads into research? Did you look for a grad program specifically with hammerheads or sharks in general? Or were you looking at a specific university? And how do you recommend getting into this shark universe in a university setting and making yourself stand out in applications? Okay, uh, sure. Uh, that's also a very, a very good question that all, all people that we study sharks or whatever you like, uh, we have faced. Uh, for example, when I when I first studied marine biology, I didn't know that I wanted to study sharks until I first saw my first shark. It was a bull shark in Kaupulmo National Parks, and since I saw that uh, that sharks, I knew I wanted to study sharks. So I tried. I initially tried to get involved with the people that are studying sharks. Uh, that's when that's how I reached Pelagios Gakunja. That is the NGO. You can see the logo in that acknowledgement. That's uh, in the last page of my presentation. I reached to those guys uh, initially they if they have some like standby project that you can have or like in internship or something like that uh, that's how it worked and for my hammerhead studies I propose the my own research I since I know about hammerheads and I know when we're lacking of information I know all the all the issues that other past researchers have been having since the late 70s i wanted to build my own project i look my own funding i and i'm in in that in that station right now i'm uh, i'm finalizing looking for my funding i build my own project i present it to the organization they clear it they say it's a good it's, it's a good research and about the university for example here in, here in mexico we have a, a lot of uh, very good research centers a lot of what marine research centers i'm, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure uh, all over the world we have them. Um, the PhD or the master's degree, you enter it. It's, it's like a, gen, it's not generic, but it's like a general master's degree. It's a master in science, master in marine science. And then for you to get, uh, for you to get accepted in this program, of course, you have to arrive to, this, uh, to your interview with an already built project. Because since they give you like a specific amount of time to develop a project, for example, for master's is two years, you have to arrive uh, with a proposed project, with a methodology, with what you want to do, with whom, what are your uh, your main goals, and so on and so forth. For the PhD, uh, it's the same thing. This project can be more ambitious because you, you have four years to do it. So what I would recommend is to first identify in, uh, a group of researchers or a researcher that do the thing that you want to study. If there are sharks or mantas or whatever, start looking online, start all these lo logos that, that you can that you see here on the acknowledgement page. page. All these logos, many of them are, uh, are NGOs. A lot of them, uh, most of them, of course, is shark people. So check these places out, see what they're doing. Uh, if you have an idea of uh, research, you have if you want a, a specific interest in one specific species. I study hammerheads because it's my favorite animal. But, and coincidentally, hammerheads is my favorite animal. It's endangered. It's need a lot of research, and that mixture of things make me passionate about it. So okay, I like the animal. There's a lot of things to be done, and I want to help it. So that's how it works. So find out. What you want to do? What species? What kind of thing? And of course, there are a lot of these NGOs start like an internship program or volunteer programs. But if you have no idea what you want to do right now, you can get in one of these volunteer programs 
to see, to get familiarized with the animal, to get familiarized with the techniques, with the studies that we're doing, and then you can choose your own path. Awesome. Thank you so much for that information. Really, really great. Um, thanks again for taking the time today to sit down and talk with us and all that. Um, for those who have been diving with us in Baja before, some of you may recognize Pete. He actually works with us on all our whale shark tours out in La Paz and everything like that. Um, he's uh, heavily involved in doing kind of ecotourism and these kind of things too. If you're ever looking at going down to Baja, make sure to check him out and check out the, he work, runs a company called Shark Encounters. Um, and then also you know, I put the link for Palacios, uh, the organization he's working with. Um, into the um, chat box if you want to make a donation to their research or check out more of what he's doing and what the rest of the team's doing over there, please check it out and everything like that. Thanks again for everybody being in today and stopping by. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. We've got Lucretia coming to do a free diving workshop, a breathing workshop, something a little bit different than we've been doing so far. So looking forward to checking that out and everything like that. Thanks to Ellen for stopping in. And Pete, thank you so much, brother. It's been great to see you again. Hope to see you in the water very soon. Hope to see you soon, man. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I, I know that there's a couple, of, a couple of questions that haven't answered. I don't know if I can answer them right here, but if I cannot, just copy and paste that question to my Facebook or whatever, and I'm really glad to help uh, to answer any other questions that you have. Yeah, guys, the same thing is I'm just going to say the same is if you have more questions or anything like that, you can definitely jump on any of the Ocean Stories posts on Dive Ninjas. Um, throw a post in there and just put it as like, you know, hashtag intro to hammers or something like that. And we'll make sure to tag Pete in it so he gets it. Or you can hit him up on his social media, too, and all that. Um, and yeah, you can also answer questions in here, Pete, if you want to type out answers or we can just push it to uh, have him do it on social media. This way we can all interact back and forth and everything. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Have a good one, guys. Thank you, Jay. Bye.